Hi, this is Matthew Cruz in Creighton Radiology, and welcome to the mini-lecture on contrast-induced nephropathy. This lecture is a little different from the others in that there are not many imaging findings. However, it is relevant to those who will order imaging or interpret imaging. So let's get started. Contrast-induced nephropathy has several definitions in the literature. The most common and general definition is worsening renal function within 48 hours of receiving contrast material. According to the ACR, this should be an increase in serum creatinine of 50% or of 0.3 milligrams per deciliter. This can also be a decrease in urine output to less than 0.5 milliliter per kilogram per hour. This should be in the situation when alternate explanations for renal impairment are excluded. And in general, this refers to iodinated contrast material which is the type of contrast that we use for CT, fluoroscopy, coronary angiography, and other vascular procedures. Other types of contrast material used in, in radiology, such as gadolinium-based contrast for MRI, would be rare to cause renal impairment. The pathogenesis for contrast-induced nephropathy is not completely understood, but acute tubular necrosis, or ATN, probably plays a role. Some studies have suggested that it is actually functional changes in the tubular cells rather than necrosis. Renal vasoconstriction may play a role inducing ischemia in the renal tubules or a direct cytotoxic effect of the contrast material. The most important risk factor for contrast-induced nephropathy is pre-existing renal disease. This is why radiology departments will perform or request renal labs prior to administrating contrast to some patients. Other risk factors include diabetes, the dose and type of contrast used, newer non-ionic low osmolar agents are lower risk, acute kidney injury is also considered a risk. Some less concrete risk factors which are in the literature include older age, congestive heart failure, cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome, multiple myeloma, and anemia. Also in the literature or discussed by nephrologists and people in medicine is a single kidney or renal transplant. Generally, people are hesitant to give these people contrast unless totally necessary, but the recent literature would suggest that the overall renal function is the most important factor and not whether someone has one or two kidneys. So most institutions will require recent renal function labs. If patients are over 60, or if they have one of these risk factors. Identifying patients at risk. Several GFR thresholds are used, and these vary by institution. The most conventional is that if your GFR is more than 45, you're okay to receive contrast pretty much anywhere. Some newer recommendations from the ACR state that if the GFR is actually above 30, these patients are at minimal risk and should pretty much always be able to receive contrast material. An exception would be if their GFR is less than 45 and they have some other risk factor, such as diabetes or proteinuria, which indicates pre-existing renal disease. Methods of prevention for contrast-induced nephropathy. The logical method is to only administer contrast when it's necessary, but other than that, the most common and best evidence method is hydration. So this would be drinking fluids if the patient is low risk or IV fluids if the patient is moderate or high risk. And the best evidence may actually be for a longer period of fluid administration from one hour before until 12 hours after the contrast was administered. Current agents, which are non-ionic and low osmolar, should be used if possible. This reduces the risk of nephropathy. Some evidence or prior studies have discussed sodium bicarbonate but this is currently felt to be equivalent to normal saline for hydration. Not routinely used, so some nephrologists or other physicians may suggest stopping nephrotoxic medications such as NSAIDs before receiving IV contrast, but this is not routinely done at all institutions. And N-acetylcysteine has been used in the past to prevent contrast nephropathy, but this is not routinely used in the US. Incidence, natural history, and prognosis. 
In the general population, the incidence of contrast-induced nephropathy is 0.6 to 2.3%. But in studies of interventional cardiology patients, patients undergoing cardiac catheterization, the incidence is as high as 14.5%, and up to 0.7% of these patients require dialysis. This may be due to higher contrast volume in these cardiology studies or intraarterial administration. In the majority of cases, renal function improves in three to seven days. This is less time than most cases of acute tubular necrosis, and that's why the theory of functional changes comes into play. In the majority of cases, the serum creatinine returns to normal. However, persistent renal impairment is possible, and the risk of renal impairment that is persistent is higher in patients who had pre-existing chronic kidney disease. There is some controversy regarding this entity and, in fact, the term contrast-induced nephropathy. A newer recommended term is contrast-associated acute kidney injury. The controversy stems from the fact that most early studies where this entity was defined were not controlled, so patients would be administered contrast in the emergency department or within the hospital, get admitted to the hospital, and then their renal function would deteriorate. But there is no control group of patients that were followed at the same time. So this points to an association, not necessarily a causality. And some large controlled studies may suggest that other factors were contributing to this nephrotoxic exposure, hypovolemia, cardiac dysfunction, infection, things that are very common in admitted patients. The newer recommended term, contrast-associated acute kidney injury, is when other causes of AKI cannot be excluded and contrast-induced acute kidney injury is when a thorough clinical evaluation has excluded all other causes of acute kidney injury. You can imagine this may be difficult in some admitted patients. The statement from the ACR is that at the current time, it is the position of the ACR Committee on Drugs and Contrast Media that contrast-induced acute kidney injury is a real, albeit rare, entity. If you have a patient with acute kidney injury of unclear cause, the first and often only indicated radiology test is a renal ultrasound. This is the table from the ACR appropriateness criteria stating that renal ultrasound should be the first test in the majority of these patients. So the reason to do a renal ultrasound in a patient with acute kidney injury is basically to look for renal obstruction. Ultrasound is very good at identifying hydronephrosis or an obstructed kidney and this is a potentially treatable cause of AKI. In patients who do not have renal obstruction, you may see some other findings on ultrasound. The kidneys may appear normal. However, they may be enlarged. They may have increased renal echogenicity. And on Doppler evaluation, they may have elevated intrarenal arterial resistive index. Here are a couple of sample ultrasound images. And in the upper image, you can see the right kidney sitting next to the liver. Normally, the kidney should be isoechoic or hypoechoic relative to the liver, but this kidney is hyperechoic or too bright, and the left kidney similarly is hyperechoic. So this is an abnormal renal ultrasound in someone with AKI. And finally, I'd like to show you some incidental CT findings of acute tubular necrosis. These CT scans would be done for some other reason, and these are just incidental findings in the kidneys. There are two patterns of ATN on CT. One is a striated nephrogram, which is variable cortical contrast retention with striations or stripes of hyperdensity and hypodensity. The other would be diffuse cortical contrast retention for several days after the administration. Here are two CT examples in different patients of these patterns. Both of these scans are not contrast enhanced. You can see the aorta is not filled with contrast on the upper image. So there is diffuse cortical contrast retention in the upper image and a striated nephrogram pattern with these linear stripes of hyperdensity in the lower image. This concludes the lecture on contrast-induced nephropathy and AKI. Thank you.